Keith Johnson is an extraordinary man who shared what he was doing in the moment, which was he was interested in how human beings behaved and how that connected to theatre and what theatre might be. I would say he was a kind of impro researcher, a scientist with a very playful trickster spirit at his heart, but also a kind of honest, um, a kind of honesty about what he was discovering. So you can chart his experimentation and his through the different things he created, the different forms that grew out of it, through his books and what he was researching. But there's a kind of, I think I connected to the work because if you read Impro, you feel like he's really talking to you about what he was excited about in theatre. He was on a journey of exploration. And I felt like I managed to read that book at the point where I was beginning in theatre and he gave me permission to play with things, try things out, mess up and not think theatre was this thing that you had to kind of go, this is how it's done. Theatre was this big area of research where you could try things out and really look for what worked, what didn't. If you were playful, you could really make good theatre by accident on the way. But that was the thing that kept you excited. That's what's great about impro. He says, this, my life was like this. And I was, when I was a child, I was surprised. And there's real curiosity and honesty in what he's, he was communicating about in that book. I remember Angelico saying, oh, Keith, we've heard about this show that you're doing called Life Game, that he was, um, he was developing and he was playing with. And I know he took some persuasion to actually explain to us what it was. And it was only on the last two days that we did it. And uh, people said, what's this show, Life Game, that you've, you're doing? He said, well, it's basically an interview with a guest. We interviewed them about their life. There's a team of improvisers. One of the people, um, the guest chooses to play them for the evening. And then you do a whole show with an interval. It's a two-hour show. And you go through their life. And you hear stories. And at certain points, you decide to enact those stories in an improvised way. The guest doesn't ever play themselves. They play other characters from their lives. So they might end up playing their grandmother, or they might end up playing a teacher that they loved, or a teacher that they hated. Um, and uh, it, what's interesting about it as a show is it's, of course, people remembering things, but in the process of showing scenes in the moment, improvised, the guest has moments where they remember things they have not seen for years and years and years. It's like a kind of dream door access into their memories. And it's as much about watching the guest experience seeing these moments from their life um, uh, inhabited and theatricalised. The audience watch the guest and the scenes. They're always checking up with the guest how they're enjoying it or not. And it's an extraordinary form because it's basically storytelling. And there's a great thing I think that Keith says, which is that, you know, if theatre hadn't been invented, Life Game would be a, a great place to start. And I would say that's absolutely right um, because it includes the seeds of how I'm sure theatre came about. So it's this new idea of a show, it's actually an ancient idea that probably existed and Keith found a way to tap back into that. And it is a source of kind of creative fuel. If you do Life Game as a show, you vicariously learn a bunch of skills about impro games that are about connecting the performers to themselves. It creates ensemble, it creates community. And Keith talked about this thing of like, people who'd improvised together for years would do Life Game and they would find out things about their friends they had not known. And as I say, even the guests themselves tap into memories that they haven't remembered for years and years and years. So it, it's kind of, it's beautiful because it, it 
has this ability to create scenes that are incredibly funny and then can turn on a sixpence um, or on a dime, uh, but to use, to use Keith's terminology, turn on a sixpence, and suddenly become very moving. And it, it demonstrates that improvisation isn't just about laughter. It's about things that are moving. It's about things that are surprising. It's about relationship, and it's about... So it has at its heart a real story which engenders an environment in which the improvisers take the material that they're making seriously. So you're kind of treating it with respect and you're turning it into theatre in the moment. It's, it's beautiful. Generally, at that time, improv was this what I would say, a marginalised form. It was not treated seriously as theatre. Um, however, I saw myself as a theatre maker. Um, impro was kind of perceived as comedy, lightweight, less status, I would say. I wanted it to be taken seriously, so I wanted it to be done in theatre spaces. I wanted it to have a proper set. I wanted the performers in it to be paid. And... Over the years, I applied for money to the Arts Council. I remember there was another fund called the Barclays New Stages, and we applied. We, never, we didn't get the funding. So it, but I also said, I'm not going to do it until it's properly funded. And it took many years. Uh, we eventually formed, many years later, I mean, it's a long time later, we formed Improbable. We did our first show, which was 70 Hill Lane. And after that show... Our second show, because we'd done uh, 70 Hill Lane, we, got, we could then say, we're going to do our next show. It's called Life Game. It's an improvised show. And we got proper funding to pay people, not large amounts of money, but proper you know, equity rates for people. So people who were in the show got paid to do an impro show, which at that time did not happen. Your pay was how much money there was left at the box office. So, and that was about us taking it seriously. It was also about wanting it to be taken seriously as a show. And very often, if we did impro shows, we didn't say that they were improvised because people would perceive it as a certain thing. We were just making theatre shows and uh, we used improvisation. Of course, we talked about it, but we didn't say they were improv shows or impro shows. They were theatre shows, and I think we still keep that sensibility about the shows that we make. If we were to do a new um, improvised show, we would say it's a theatre show. Improbable are a company that make theatre, um, and at the heart of all the shows that we do, and there's a variety of shows, sometimes they're totally improvised shows, sometimes they're shows that uh, tackle text and play, um, and we will use improvisational ways with text. Sometimes um, we've, uh, in the last uh, 12 years, we've been doing operas. The, the skills that you use when you include improvisation in the way that you work inform all those different forms I would say with uh, the work that we make and that could be simply that you know at the start of a rehearsal you do some impro games and you have a re you have a sense of why you're doing that of what you're trying to build you're trying to build connection ensemble and ability to play uh, engendering an excitement about not doing things exactly the same that sensibility has gone through all those shows and basically keeps me interested in making shows. It's why I'm still doing theatre. I think if I was just doing plays, I would probably have given up. But that wellspring of spirit that comes from improvisation that I learnt through Keith and through that initial excitement is still feeding me in all the things we do. Even now, we do our open space events where we get people working together. It's the same thing. It's the same set of feeling skills about how you work together, about how you 
trust people to do things and you trust their agency and you trust the excitement of not knowing what's going to happen next. One of the examples of how we've used Impro, we, sometimes we use improvisation to devise shows. Um, and uh, one of those shows was a show we did called Shock-Headed Peter. Um, and we were asked to adapt a children's storybook of kind of macabre cautionary tales. There was a band called the Tiger Lilies that had set all these nursery rhymes to music. And we brought together um, different elements, puppetry, a, a visual kind of landscape for it. But we didn't have a central story for it. And I remember myself and Julian, who we co-created it, sat down at a, a then, a, 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 you know, a computer, and we wrote a word at a time story. We plugged two keyboards in. I wrote one word, he wrote, and we alternated, and we did a word at a time fairy tale that became the fairy tale that created the whole story that held the whole thing together. So it's an example of where you take a kind of one of Keith's games and then you take it into how you write. Lee and I wrote another show called uh, Get Off My Foot and we did the same thing. We wrote it a word at a time because, you know, sitting down writing a play probably was not really the kind of thing. So Shock Headed Peter was a kind of crazy show where it's a show that celebrated failure we didn't finish the show. Uh, the last kind of 10 minutes of the show, we didn't have an end for before we opened. And the first five shows, I would say, had different endings each night. Slowly, that show, it kind of developed in a show that, into a show that fixed it. It was originally about three hours long, and it shrank the more we did it and became a sort of two-hour show. But it was one of those shows that, you didn't plan to make a successful show. It was a kind of show where we put all the crazy things that you wouldn't normally put in a show into the show and became a surprising hit. I got asked to do an opera, uh, fit with, work with Philip Glass. Um, and there's something about uh, the kind of sensibility around improvisation that it kind of asks you to play with putting things together. That's one of the things I've learned. And a sensibility about not trying to impress audiences enjoying the process of how you make things. If you're going to make puppets, you, they enjoy seeing you put them together. And that sensibility, if you can take that into a bigger context, like an opera house, informed Satyagraha. So you go, we've got a crazy idea for Act 3. We're going to use sticky tape. And you go, a bit of you would go, that's, a, that's too stupid an idea. But improvisation teaches you that you can take a risk with what that might be and audiences will love it. Not because it's impressive, but because you're doing it in front of their eyes. And I think we've managed to take some of that sensibility into spaces like, you know, that, that show, Satyagraha, ended up on the stage of the Metropolitan Opera. It's the same kind of sensibility that Impro has, but you can, if you're courageous, you can take it into other contexts. So, I'm about to do a show uh, which will be more like the first uh, 70 Hill Lane show, a storytelling, life game type show, doing the... Philip Glass Opera, I've managed to persuade him to get in a rehearsal room with me, slowly wooed him into the room, and I basically ended up doing storytelling. Philip's hung around, and he was in the room, and eventually he sat at the piano, bashed up old piano in the La Mama rehearsal space, and basically Philip was improvising. And then I'd tell this story, and Philip would go, oh. and he was really enjoying hanging out in the room improvising in the way that we would devise. And my guess is that was a sensibility with which he first started doing his work. Philip doesn't have a thing of, this is how it's got to be done. He likes to see his operas done in different ways. We had this week where we were told Philip, oh, Philip, he's not been too great of late. He, 
He probably um, well, he's probably come in for half an hour for two days. We had a week's rehearsal. He turned up on day one, and he said, "Come on, we've only got a, a week. Uh, we've got to do a run on Saturday." And I was like, "What?" And he stayed every day, and by the last day, we did a run. He'd written ten pieces of music. He had a, a way of working that was kind of like how an improv pianist would have. And Philip really enjoys playing his music live. It's not perfect, beautiful playing of Philip's music. It's got a, a feeling about it that it's like a kind of the same as a, an improviser. So it, it's, it's been a kind of strange journey towards us basically improving in the room. There's one... There's one thing, uh, this may not end up in the documentary, but I, I want to tell you about. We made a show called Coma, and it was about the work of a guy called um, Arnold Mindell. There's a coma exercise that you do where one person pretends to be in the coma. The other person communicates with the person in the coma through touch, breathing like, like them. It's like an impro game, but it's touch. And if you're pretending to be in a coma, you really know whether the person is connected to you. I told Philip about this, and he said, D stop talking about it, just do it. I said, what? He said, lie on the floor and be, pretend to be in a coma. I'll try and reach you. So I was like, oh. I lay on the floor, pretended to be in a coma. Philip sat at the piano, and he, in the moment, improvised this piece of music which is him communicating with me through music in a coma and it was this 11 minute piece of music that is the most extraordinary beautiful piece of music and he is he's improv you can see his hands on the piano feeling his way through the music and he's he's improvising it's and it's beautiful all on camera we got it all on camera, and he's now written that down as a piece. It will be in the show. You know, Keith's one of our elders now. I would say what's al alive in me is the feeling of, like, what happens um, to a, a person who's a great teacher, to their body of work and how it's looked after. Because, as we know, you know, um, as we get older, um, I'm now an older improviser. Keith is at, you know, he's at the end of his life. What, what, you know, in life game, you ask, you know, what's going to happen at the end of your life? How do you want to die? So on and so on. What's going to happen to Keith's work when he's not still around? Because there will be a point when that's the case. How does it get looked after? And I would say... There's a kind of spirit about how Keith worked that you can read in that first book that I read when I read Impro, which is about curiosity and about being almost like a scientist in looking, experimenting, trying things out, you know, which have created all these games. And it's not the games that are the key. Of course, they're useful, but what's the key is the spirit of curiosity with which Keith went, is this really helping people learn how to write? Is this really how we should be teaching our children around creativity? And he just was experimenting. There's a longer story of what happens with improvisation as it goes beyond us, beyond, you know, as it continues. And hopefully the world still exists after we're not around improvisation should continue beyond us because, you know, we didn't, you know, Keith didn't in, invent impro. Uh, no one invented impro. It existed <laughs> already. It was life. And it was storytelling. So who knows how it will develop? But Keith gave us some gifts, I would say, as to know how to keep tapping into the source and the spirit of it that you can capture. And if you do that, you will invent your own version of what improv, improv whatever it gets called, will be.